Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. My name is Lex. Uh, I will be your tech person. I'm kind of going to be in the background. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I will be there in case you need any help with anything. You can shoot me a private message. Um, there's also Ellery is on our team. And so if you need some help, you can reach out to either one of us. Um, and before we jump in with Mark and Dr. Najad, I want to take you all through this little fun kind of silly thing that I do called Techie Checky. And the purpose of Techie Checky is just to make sure that we are all on the same page in Zoom and that nobody is lost. So I will share this little fun thing with you now. All right. So the first thing that I wanna show you on here, it seems pretty basic, but it is your Zoom window. And the reason that I indicate this to you all is because sometimes it seems like tools on the bottom have disappeared. And that's usually just because you have to expand your Zoom window. So if you're missing the chat function or you know how to start your video, the button down the left-hand corner, it's usually just that you gotta make the window a little bit bigger, easy fix. Um, there are closed captions available to you. Zoom has this feature now that will provide live subtitles. So you can find that down at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you click on the CC live transcript button. A little menu should appear and you can select show subtitle and you will have pretty accurate subtitles of everything we're saying. The next thing is we would love to see everybody's faces. So we are on Zoom. We're not sharing physical space right now, but we want it to feel as much like we are as possible. So if everybody could have their videos on, then we can chat with each other and see faces and body language and not look at you know little gray squares. So we would love that. The other thing I wanna mention is that while Mark is telling us all these stories about his photos, um, we want you to have questions for him. We want to engage with you. So if you want to throw some questions in the chat throughout, um, we will call on folks later, bring them on screen, unmute you, and you can ask Mark your questions. So just pop them into the chat and we will be monitoring that and uh, hopefully we can get to as many people as possible. Um, the other couple of things I want to mention is just how to kind of optimize your view. So I think that if you choose speaker view, it's kind of ideal because you will um, you won't you know be distracted by a lot of little video boxes. You'll really just see Mark and Dr. Najad. For now, you just see me, but in a little bit, you will see them. 
And then the last thing for kind of optimizing your view is to hide non-video participants. All that means is that you won't see little gray squares. You would only see people who have their videos on. And there are two different ways where you can find that tool. The first, um, it just depends on what version of Zoom you have, but in the top right-hand corner where you selected speaker view, there may be an option there to hide non-video participants. If it's not there, you can find it by going to someone else's uh, little video square if they don't have it on and you can click the button with the three dots in the corner and then a little uh, menu will pop down and you can click hide non-video participants there. So, um, okay. And now I just wanna introduce our moderator, Dr. Mitra Najad. Uh, Dr. Najad is an assistant clinical professor at the UCLA Stein Eye Institute and the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. She is an ophthalmologist who specializes in advanced surgical procedures for cataracts and laser vision correction. In addition to teaching UCLA medical students and residents, she also does clinical research on cataract and refractive surgery. Dr. Najad has done all of her training at UCLA, including medical school and residency training. So she's a true Bruin through and through. She loves to travel and put her iPhone photography tricks to use, but rest assured her surgical skills far exceed any photography skills. So take it away, Dr. Najad. Thank you, Lex. Um, uh, thank you everybody for joining us, welcome. Uh, I think you're in for a very, very exciting evening or afternoon, depending on which coast you're joining us from. Um, I'm Mitra Najad, as Lex said, I'm an assistant clinical professor of ophthalmology at UCLA. I'm honored to be part of the, the pretty large faculty body that we have at the UCLA Sinai Institute because we've been on the forefront of innovation and research and eye care. Um, for almost 50 years, we've had a history of uh, providing eye care and the Institute has been consistently ranked in the top five eye care centers uh, in the country. And, you know, so-called best in the West. Um, and on the research front, we've always been kind of on the forefront and contributed to some groundbreaking research. Uh, most recently, uh, one of the first centers to use stem cell therapy for macular degeneration. Uh, I personally do cataract surgery, which I love because it's so fulfilling um, to restore vision and quality of life for patients. I particularly love taking care of photographers because uh, it's that mix of taking care of engineers and artists. They they understand the physics and the optics behind their lenses. They also understand the artistry and uh, have a great appreciation for regaining contrast and colors. Um, and it was an absolute pleasure to, to get to know uh, Mr. Mark Sennett and help take care of him um, because he has such a great appreciation of how his eyes work um, and uh, also because of his renowned accomplishments. Um, he is a film and movie producer as well as this celebrity photographer and having been a time life photographer for over 25 years, he's photographed past presidents, sports and music legends. Um, and when he told me about his idea to do this, I agreed to uh, participate without any hesitation. Um, I love that I get to be involved in this. And without further delay, uh, I'd like to introduce you to someone who's not only a visionary, but I also know with proof is also has 2020 vision. So uh, without further ado, this is uh, Mr. Mark Sennett. Thank you, Dr. Dijon. I appreciate that. And um, I just want to say that this whole experience with Dr. Najad and the Eye Institute really brought back my vision, which I was really concerned that I was losing. And uh, I was falling quite a bit and um, really kind of losing my way and thought my career was over as a photographer. And then I decided that uh, through my wife's help, I went to see Dr. Najad and we kind of focused in on everything that's been going on with my eyesight. And it was, after the surgery, the amazing thing to me was after having all these problems about focusing my camera, feeling very insecure about, oh, what am I going to do next if I screw up the shot? When I, when I left Dr. Nujan after my operation and she gave me these pair of sunglasses and I went out and I saw for the first time, everything was in focus. Everything was bright. The colors were beautiful. And it was like a whole new day. It was just, it was just amazing. And I couldn't wait to get my cameras back on because I've been kind of, to be honest with everybody, I've been kind of hiding behind my assistant or hiding behind, you know, the problems of, of how, do, how do you shoot fine art photography when you can't see it? <laughs> and autofocus folks doesn't do the whole thing and nor do your iPhones. 
But um, so what I wanted to do is kind of take you through my career a little bit um, from the beginning and take you a little bit through the decades um, because they're so fascinating. And, um, and I feel like I, you know, have a whole second chance at bat now that I can really approach my photography in a way that I couldn't approach it before. Not just because of my age, that has one thing to do with it. But the other thing that's important is that how I can see everything now, how I can see the colors. I can also see the angles. I mean, I've, I'm known for my celebrity photography, but something I have in, in, in common with Dr. Nujat is we both love to shoot landscapes. And landscapes are beautiful to shoot as is people. But there's something in a solitude where you go out and you see a field or you see whatever you're looking for. And you can really, I can really now focus in and take in the moment and not just be so, you know, concerned and have this trepidation that the film is not going to come out. <laughs> so anyway, without further ado, I'd like to show you my first photograph um, where kind of my life started in New York City in 1971. And New York at this point was kind of the way we are today in 2021. I mean, it was shootouts in New York. You, you really were um, mafia dons were being killed, um, police riots going on up in Harlem, uh, all over the city. It was extremely dangerous. I had a police radio in my bedroom. I had a police radio in my car. So every time there was a shootout or something was going on, I jump into the car. And, and go try to, you know, get there so I could sell my photograph in those days for like 50 bucks to the Associated Press or the Wires. So I want to show you the first, the first phone, the first photograph, which is of Mafia leader Joe Colombo. This was the one day in my life that probably changed my career forever. Uh, you know, in Manhattan at this point, uh, if you've seen The Godfather, there was that whole scene where everybody would go down to the Lidley and they'd have the march and they'd stuff the money and everything. And it was beautiful that they carried on every year. But this, at this point, they decided to have this rally with the Italian American Civil Rights League with 100,000 people. And I was making, and I was stringing for the Associated Press. And um, as I was making my way through from Tavern on the Green over to Central Park West to where the fountain was, there was 100,000 people there. But luckily I had my New York City press pass and I made my way over to about maybe 15 feet of this man laying on the ground. And his name is Joe Colombo. He was the Don and the head of the five families who was trying to integrate the mafia. Um, with different minorities. And he had been on the cover of Time Magazine the week before, and they sent, and Joey Gallo sent in a crew from Providence to have him killed by this black assassin um, from up there. And by the way, I was standing next to the assassin and talking to him for about five minutes. He was about six foot four. His name was Jerome Johnson, and he was totally dressed in white. He was I, I couldn't believe it. And Big Mouth over here started talking to him and saying, so where are you from? What do you, what do you do? And he just kind of looked down at me and I kind of got that look like, don't bother me. Next thing I know, about five seconds later, he pulls out his gun from his waistband and goes over to Joe Colombo and shoots him at least three times. And then Colombo's men then shoot Jerome Johnson. So you've got one man dead. You've got You've got um, Joe Colombo with his brains out on the, on the ground there. And, um, and then I got pulled on not by the police because I was only the one or two photographers that was there. And they wanted my film. I wouldn't give them my film. The Associated Press came back and said to me, Mark, we'll get you out of here. And they published the photograph, which went around the world. It didn't do a lot for Joe Colombo, but it started my photographic career. career. And, um, and and the interesting thing about this, you know, when you just say you took the photograph, your instincts are bullets are flying. What do you do? Um, and I hit the ground. 
And strangely enough, I wasn't scared. I just thought that my job right here and now was to get this photograph because what photographers are known for is you go into the line of fire. You do not back up from it. And so I was able, even though it was a little shaky, as you can see, I got four frames of film and um, very proud of the shot. So that was the, and if there's any, I guess we go to a Q and A, I guess if anybody has any questions about that. That's such an amazing story, Mark. Thank you. Um, I, I'm gonna check the chat to see if any of our audience members have asked um, any questions. And please, uh, I encourage you to ask any questions if, if uh, you have any. I have one question is, was it a choice to do this in black and white? Was that just the film that you had in there? And in that moment, you decided to shoot it in black and white? That's a great question because um, in the early days in the 70s, um, it was really about black and white because the Associated Press, the United Press International, the New York Times, every paper was just doing black and white. And so you really, what we used to do, just carry an extra camera body of color, just thinking in the future that we had it. I didn't that day, I only had one camera. And, um, and I remember it as vividly, because I'd been in a number of shootouts before, because in New York, you know, when, as soon as the police radio went off and there was a shootout in Harlem, you get there and see if you can get the shot and do that. So it was only black and white. And also the thing which you became friendly Dr. Najad with the police, you know, because you had a police radio and we had a light. My friend and I had a light. We had a blue light. We put it on top of the car and we would ride into these events like we were somebody. Um, and you'd get out and, you know, take the photographs. So, yeah, I'm not sure if anybody had any questions, but I can move on. Um, it doesn't look like, and uh, Lex wanted you all to know t as well, that if you wanted to just use your raise your hand function, I can always pull you up and, and share your video and you can ask uh, Mark any questions live as well. I did just get a question from oh. Paul. Paul, I'm gonna pull you on screen and let you unmute so you can just ask Mark. Go ahead. Hello, Mr. Harrison. Uh, hello, old friend, how are you? I'm good. Hi, Flick. Hey, listen, uh, um, I, I've got so many, so many questions, but sticking just to this photograph uh, for the moment, you know, we've all, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, you know, journalist. My wife's uh, a neurojournalist, and and you know, there's many times when you've been in situations where you just know the police, they want to have what's in your camera, and if you're refusing to hold hand over what you've got, uh, um, what was their reaction? Their reaction was, um, you know, we want to see this film, we can see this film, and I was a newbie. So I didn't know any better, but I knew enough to call, you know, the bureau chief at AP and to come and get me, you know, and, um, and I made more Paul than 50 bucks that day. I made like 300. So it was, a, it was, it was a good day. It was a good day all around. <laughs> no, well, you've been in, that, been in that situation and I was in that situation with your father many times, you know, um, we would travel around the world and, you know, you get in that situation and you would just make the decision, either you want to do it the easy way or the hard way, because you have to come across, you have to come back with that photograph, whether you work for the London Daily Express, or you work for Sky, or you work for Life Magazine. I mean, those were the things that were, you, if you didn't come back with that, at least with the lead photograph, you know, you kind of got a little, you know, it, you didn't do as well as you should have. But circumstances yeah. sometimes, you know, can't help you with that. But thanks for calling. It's great to see you both. It's great to see you both. Yeah, too. Good. Love to Thank the you, Paul and Felicity. So, Paul, thanks. Thanks, Flip. So, Mark, do you want to go to the, the next photo? Sure. The next photo um, is my friend um, Dudley Moore. And you don't know what I was, my friend that was just on Paul Harrison. Um, was from Sky TV, and his dad and I used to work together at the London Daily Express. And um, we, we traveled a lot, and Dudley Moore, in the early days, in the 70s, was always, he had a, he had a comedy act called Cook and Moore. And um, Dudley was, and I became very friendly during this early 70s. And so this photograph, which, uh, which we did in the 80s, 
Dudley was had you know become a huge film superstar, and uh, had had but was a major pianist, and he had just been invited to Carnegie Hall uh, to play a debut there in 1988, and. Um, and the office called me, People Magazine called and said, we really like to illustrate how do we do this photograph of Dudley, not in Carnegie Hall, but before he gets there. So to make this a long story short, before we jump into it, um, Dudley had a beautiful Steinway about probably 25,000, whatever those Steinways cost, in his living room in Venice, California, where he would always play. And I asked Dudley, I said, could we lift your piano out, take it out to the beach? at noontime and have you play the piano in a tuxedo, you know, with the, with the uh, Pacific Ocean in the background. And of course he said no. And um, so I had to go to the magazine if we could borrow $10,000 to rent all of this and somehow, somehow get the piano out to the beach um, noontime because, because Dudley had to fly to New York the following day to debut at Carnegie Hall. So this shot is my illustration and crazy idea um, of Dudley playing his concerto on the Santa Monica beach in his tuxedos and tail. And there's a dog that comes into the shot, um, heard Dudley playing. It's a black and white dog. It's a black and white piano. Dudley's in a tuxedo. And this dog started howling, swear to God, started howling and ran into the picture. So here we go. So this was, I mean, it was one of the strangest photo sessions I've ever had in my life. I just see this dog kind of running at us. And, um, and when Dudley started to play, but before that, the key about this whole shot is when you're under deadline and you've got to get the celebrity over to, you know, back across country so they can perform in Carnegie Hall. There's managers, there's publicists, there's everybody in the world saying, you cannot do this. Well, we had to hire, six day workers in order to put plywood down to move the piano out to the beach <laughs> and i as dudley's coming to us you know with his entourage of people going you know we got to get you out of here um this photograph hung in the time life building for about five years and uh and it was just spontaneous to be perfectly honest i had not planned on the dog <laughs> i really don't even know the dog's name but he could howl and sing with dudley so that's my that's my story on Dudley. And one more thing about Dudley, you know, this man had more women in his life. He was called Cuddly Dudley. I think I did three People magazine covers on him with three different women. <laughs> um, and just the nicest man to be around and was very generous. If you, if you get a celebrity or your, you know, the, your person that you're photographing to, the worst thing everybody hates is to be photographed. So if you come in with something that you can make them relax, make them have fun with the picture, and something as crazy as this, um, I always take pride in that. So any questions on this one? <laughs> nope. I have one quick question while we're waiting for Lex to key someone up. Oh, you know what? She already did, or we already have one. Alex, you wanna ask a question? Yeah, hey, how's it going? Sorry, okay, I'm totally not ready to be on camera. But um, <laughs> so between, <laughs> good to see you. Um, Two bags. With the first photograph, you like were capturing a moment that was happening mm -hmm. just as it happened. Like you had the police scanner, you went down, you mm -hmm. got Columbo, and then for the second one, you planned it and yet still were capturing the like unexpected. So between those two, like in the approach to photography, is that kind of the through line is just trying to capture something unplanned? Not really. Um, it always should come unplanned during the session, you know, because <laughs> I mean, the, the easy answer to that is, you know, known for setting up very big events, also doing very small events. 
either way, when you get into that situation, you know, with the person that you're interfacing with, is that you want something to happen into the situation that you put them in, whether it's a real situation that like that, which is more of a photojournalistic piece versus like, let's come up with a concept, make this thing work, you know, and then, but the unexpected, you try to also make happen. You right. know, sometimes, a lot of times with, we'll show him with Robin Williams, we'll say for the time, but, or Warren Beatty, I would always bring props because they're so stiff, not Robin. Robin, you bring anything and he, you know, he's up in the air, he's holding a duck in his arm, whatever props you bought, he would figure out how to really assimilate to that. But then there's all the shy celebrities like Warren Beatty, you know, and you bring props to make sure that things, you know, that you can get them into the mood and into the, you know, into the moment. But that's a great question because that's something that you fight with, not fight with, but you want to um, be as creative as you can and take as much out of that subject as you can to deliver that photo you're trying to get. Do you do you have a preference between the two types of photo shoots, one that is more photojournalistic and one that is more a conceptual, like, planned shoot? My brain works both ways, um, to be honest with you. Um, I love a good photojournalistic, whether it's the conventions or whether it's any politics, whether, you know, there's a certain high to that where you're on deadline, you're, you're there, and you are capturing things that is in your eye, nobody else's, you know, it might look like there's a thousand photographers that are there, but at the same time, you are there as the photographer, it's my vision of what I see, and, and um, but I enjoy both. I, to be honest with you, I probably enjoy conceptualizing <laughs> and doing big shoots and like that, because it's a, it's a different reaction, physical reaction when you, when you go to those things. You know, you get beaten up, you're, you know, hustling people out of the way and this and that. Right. But it's always nice to be honestly, it's nice. What was great about Time Life is that we were always invited. You know, you were invited to Gregory Peck's house. You were invited to Rod Stewart's house. You were invited, you know, as I said earlier, you know, if they were difficult, you try to make it un as pleasant as you can for them. A lot of times that didn't work, you know. But, but thanks for the question. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Is there a, Dr. Nirjad, do you want to ask me something? Yeah, I was, well, based off kind of following up on Alex's question, did you research these celebrities beforehand to know whether they were going to be the type that would, you know, take a prop and run mm -hmm. with it or the type where you maybe needed to inspire something in them? Usually I knew enough about them, like in Dudley's case and and, and, uh, and I photographed Warren before, and Warren's the type of guy that would show up at a shoot and say, I'm leaving, you know, I gotta go, I gotta leave, you know, and he just got there. So Dustin and I had figured out how to keep him there, you know, and so I brought champagne, swords, um, umbrellas, and, and we were able to keep him going with enough of that where it turned out to be a sensational picture where they were popping champagne um, but a lot of times, sometimes actors, uh, I know this French actor, I won't give her a name, but we were shooting a people cover. She was the star of Coma. And all she kept doing was crying in front of the camera. And every time I tried to take a picture, she burst out into tears. <laughs> I didn't know really what to do. So we canceled the shoot that day. We went out for a second day. Again, more tears. You know, by the fourth day, she was so exhausted. We finally got the photo session done. <laughs> and it was okay. So yeah, it's, it's, um, you get some, it's really also the timing that you have with somebody and how much they trust you, you know, because there's also that thing where reporters will come in and do their story and it's different journalism today than when I was doing it. You know, the reporters would come in usually and then the photographer would come in later or sometimes you would come together. But the reporters always had the hardest time because they had to break the story and they weren't as trusted as much as the photographers were. Photographers became kind of like, oh, it's, they're just a photographer and we, we can trust them. And that gave me a lot of confidence and lat it gave me more latitude to create things that, you know, you call the office up at People Magazine and say, I want to spend $10,000. And you go, why? Or Life Magazine, and they go, that makes a lot of sense. You know, we can get a photograph out of that. So anyway, that's, should I move on to the, 
Sure. Okay, we've got another question um, from Ivor. Ivor? I'm trying, can you hear me? Yes. What, okay. are you doing, what are you doing in the hospital bed? Well, I, I couldn't miss you. I couldn't wait to miss you. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to jump the gun, Mark. Mark has had a fantastic career, still has a fantastic career as a photographer. But one of the great achievements, and I, I, I apologize for jumping the gun. The what world. did you do to Ronald Reagan in Pacific Palisades? Do you remember <laughs> that? Yes. Yes, I do. It was December the 8th. It was December the 7th or 8th. And it was the home of Ronald Reagan, who I used to photograph constantly for some reason. And, um, and it was, what we did was we shut down Sunset Boulevard. There was 25,000 people that lived in, in the Pacific Palisades. And I strung up a huge banner that said the home of the 40th president, right? And, and there was, everybody came out for it. And we couldn't believe because all the Palisades kind of came right up to us. And then the next thing that happened, somebody, because John Lennon, because Oliver, you as the Beatles, you know, bookmaker, book writer, um, there was a photograph of John Lennon and Paul in the morning. I'm sorry, in my photograph, literally near my frame, you know. So Ivor, thank you for calling in. Ivor, Ivor and I started together um, and when I moved out in the late 70s and we were a we were the writer photographer team and i forgot we went on to henry Kessinger's honeymoon but we did we did we did, we did. yeah <laughs> well, he well. Didn't there. yeah well anyway <laughs> I, I i'm delighted you're on uh, my yeah. son has said why are you calling from the hospital room but i didn't want to miss you good luck with the show okay. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a shot now. Okay, okay. thanks. Bob. Thanks, Ivor. Good luck. Good luck. Bye. Thanks, Ivor. Thanks, Ivor. <laughs> so, do we think we want to go to the next photograph? Sure. Okay, little joke, right director, wrong movie. Um, I think out of everybody in my life that I've photographed, and this is hard to articulate, but I've been photographing Steven Spielberg since E.T., which is over, which is 1983. And my relationship with Steven over the years um, has been an extraordinary one. And I probably have done about 15 sessions with Stephen over the years and also just been a part of that Amblin family um, as a photographer, not as a producer. And I found every time I spent the day with Stephen for Life magazine after he won the Oscars. And when he won the Oscars for Schindler's List, it was such an honor to be asked. He asked for me to be around him that day and um, got, over, got over to the office at Amblin, the DreamWorks, and photographing Steve and holding the Oscars, the euphoria that was at Amblin that day, everybody from, that had won Oscars for the, for the movie was there, huge cake, you know, it was like one of those special days that as a, you know, as an outsider, got to photograph, I got to document. Um, I didn't bring those pictures today, um, there's some on my Instagram of Stephen holding his Oscars on his couch and this and that. But what I really want to drill down on with Stephen is this man's a genius. I mean, not only is he a genius, but he is a tremendous father, <laughs> husband. I mean, he's the, not the antithesis of what you think of Hollywood. He is the antithesis of what you think of Hollywood sometimes. But every time I got to photograph him, it was, it was such, there was like an aura around this guy that you would feel, because he would also help and we would work on the lighting. If you look at the lighting on this with them, he loved the backlight. He loved the way that there was a halo effect on ET. And then he locked me in a room for six months, not personally, um, with ET. 
And I would photograph ET in the forest. I would photograph ET on the phone, phone home, photograph ET uh, with Michael Jackson, photograph ET with every celebrity would have come in and out of the studio. But I have to say out of all of my photo sessions, I kind of treasure my relationship with, with, uh, with Steven and everybody over at Amblin uh, because I think the movies that he makes, I mean, are so heartfelt, are so unusual, cover such a variety of genres that you never, ever, ever get tired of. So for me, it to be the exclusive photographer for E.T. during that short period, you know, was really, uh, was a fantastic, you know, was a fantastic experience. Any, any questions from anybody on these guys? Mark, having um, gotten to photograph all these Hollywood royalty and world leaders and historical figures, is there anybody left on your bucket list? Yeah, I, I love to um, love to hang out with Elon Musk. Um, that's kind of on my bucket list. Elon Musk. Um, I would also, you know would love to kind of photograph um, some European models that I think would be very interesting. Um, I also am very into Formula One and, uh, and that and really um, love photographing cars. And so my bucket list is a little more in landscapes this time. I'm going to continue to continue continue to do my celebrities, continue to do that, because I find that just, and ordinary people too, that are coming, you don't have to be, even though we started People Magazine in 1973, and it's 40 million readers still today, all these years later, I think it's also fascinating to photograph normal folks and not just it have to be around a celebrity in order to get the attention. So, and we're doing a, similar to this this summer, or in the fall with my Russian colleague, uh, Stas Neiman, we're doing a joint Russian photography exhibition of our work to show that there's really, it's like a detente. There's not that much difference between maybe in Russia as far as um, their lifestyles and the way they, their, their government works, but they're still people. And the way Stas shoots his photographs and my photographs, which are totally different, but they seem to have, they mesh together uh, and, and they tell kind of a similar story on different continents, the American way and the Russian way and all the places that he's been to. So that's a big event that we're hopefully gonna do and my coffee table book, so that we're working on. Yeah. So it's about time I do that. I'm excited. Uh, what's that? I said, I'm excited for that, both, yeah. both the event and the coffee table. Thanks, me too. I think my, the, uh, the next picture we should probably go to. Since I'm it's ready for you whenever you are. I'm ready. Well, this is the Alfred Hitchcock, if we can put that up. I know somebody asked earlier about um, when a situation happens, do you, do you enjoy it more when, it, you know, when you have made it happen? This is one of those combinations. To photograph Alfred Hitchcock, this was his last movie, 1976, called Family Plot. And it was on the Paramount lot. And that man you was talking, the man you, I was just talking to in the hospital bed, we were doing this assignment for Los Angeles Magazine. And I'd come out from New York to photograph Al Alfred Hitchcock. So what's fascinating about this story is that, you know, you have to realize that when you're on the set, directors of his ilk, of his stature, of who he is, there's kind of a, there's kind of a silence on the set, you know, because Hitchcock is there. And as you know, he treats actors differently than he does other things. And, um, 
and he has great sense of humor, just an amazing sense of humor. And Bruce Stern was in the movie, Catherine Black. Um, and I'm on the set and it was in between takes and he was talking about his pacemaker to the writer. And I said, Sir Hitchcock or Sir Alfred, I don't know what I called him, but I said, would you mind showing me your pacemaker? And he's, well, of course, dear boy, I'll show you my pacemaker. And so he gave me a kiss in the first shot. Second shot, he's got a cigar in his mouth. He's unbuttoning, unbuttoning his shirt. And in the third shot, if you look closely, you, can, you can't see the scar, but certainly he's showing me his, his chest. And I just, I, I was like on cloud nine because that is a photographer, that's a photograph for the ages. I mean, you know, this, I mean, he had a great sense of humor with all those things. And, um, but his sense of humor on the set and the way he directed on the set, his actors and this and that, there was no time for humor until the, until the, you know, until the next take would happen. So anyway, there's not much more to tell you about this shot, but it's lasted now since 1976 and it's still one of my favorite photographs um, that I've ever, that I've ever taken. So any questions on this one? That's a quiet group out there. I know, don't be shy, everybody. I guess not. As a physician, it's hard to see someone show off their pacemaker while smoking tobacco, but. I know, isn't it? <laughs> I thought the same thing, Dr. Nujan, I could be like, why does he have a cigar in his mouth? So we have a Hi. question from, from New Zealand. Oh, hi. hi. How, How are, are you? you? I'm good. Nice to see you. Great to see you. Um, I know that way back mm -hmm. you did a whole series on Appalachia. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, what am I trying to say? How... How did shooting that, or is there a difference when you're shooting something like that in your mind to shooting celebrities? Oh, yeah, totally. Because then I was, I was only 20 years old mm -hmm. and when I went to Appalachia. And the reason to going to Appalachia was just to test my skills to see if I could handle it. And I really had no idea where I was going in Appalachia, but I ended up in a very rural community that was so poverty stricken and they all had black lung disease. And it, the pictures were astonishing. I remember paying them by $20 a week. I slept on the floor. They had an outhouse. Um, they had lots of relatives. They had stills and, and the little children that were all covered kind of in black flakes blackface <laughs> those moments like when the vietnamese landed at fort eglund in 1972 there was a sense of desperation there was a sense of, of humanity that when in appalachia you walked and you saw all the poverty and everything versus where we are today as the society which the celebrity society everything that's there but here was really the core, which is still there, I'm sure, of the, these homes that people could fairly, not even at the poverty rate, you know, and they'd only make their money on selling moonshine or whatever. But their kids, they tried to get their kids to somehow have an education. But that, that photo shoot got me to Look Magazine. And um, when I was 20 years old, and unfortunately they went out of business. And, um, but that was, again, one of the most powerful I'd like to find that film and I haven't found it yet, but yeah. yeah but Amazingly it's... powerful film. Well, thank you, thank you. It was, it was really um, one of the most interesting experiences. I mean, celebrities, you, with celebrities, you get caught up into Hollywood and into the whole thing. And it's wonderful. I mean, it's an amazing experience that you get to hang out with all these superstars and be a part of all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, my photographs are as important to me as they're is they're doing their work on screen, you know? So it's it's creative artwork that I think think works, but I wish I could publish my Appalachia pictures again, because I just don't, there's not a magazine or a broadcast would probably want to show all that poverty still and all that, you never know. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. 
great to see you. Thanks, Phil and Joe. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I see Mark Lockman. We're ready. <laughs> I see Mark Lockman up there, and I see Paul Harris. So I see people that have called in. And thank you for calling. Did you want to say something, Mark? Or? Remember, I remember when you started. Mm -hmm. You know, with the Colum the one at, Colum at uh, Columbus Circle with Colombo, and I remember the, the Appalachia mm -hmm. uh, shoots. So, so yeah, good thanks. to see you. Good to see you, Mark. Thanks for tuning in. I really spoke appreciate. to your bride the other day, had a nice I, conversation. Yeah, she's terrific. She's yes, she great. is. Okay. Well, thanks, Mark. Love to everybody. Thank to you. Nice. Hi. Hi, Mark. Hi. That's my bride. I'm on my own computer so I can see you up close. Okay. Hi, Sue. Hi. Okay. Bye. See you, and see you soon. Should we go to our fifth photograph? I am the greatest. Again, one of my favorite people to photograph was Muhammad Ali. <laughs> you know, this photograph, um, the backstory to this photograph is that you have to kind of get into the inner circle with Muhammad. Um, it is not that easy. There was an entourage around him. Bundini Brown and Angelo Dundee, who was the trainer, and his mother, and some of the women, and this and that. But somehow I became part of the family for a while. <laughs> and the way that Ali would, this was up at his training camp in Deer Lake, Deer Lake Pennsylvania. And this was the beginning of Super Fight 2, because he lost Super Fight 1 to Joe Frazier. And so he, the way he would train, he would go in and spar in the ring. And then he would yell out, Joe Frazier, Joe Frazier. And all of a sudden, this German shepherd would come around the corner <laughs> and jump on Muhammad. And they would be fighting like dog. And he was going to kill him. The dog was going to bite him. The problem with this photograph for me was I was standing right next to them and um, with a very wide angle lens and thinking, I'm going to die. I mean, this is not a place for me to be right now. But um, the dog had been trained and the dog's name was Joe Frazier. So the way that Ali would get himself all worked up was you just yell, Joe Frazier, Joe Frazier, and start punching at the dog. And this picture became one of his favorites um, that went around, got to spin around a lot. And it's one of my favorites because, uh, you know, when you photograph Muhammad Ali, and I photographed him probably about 10 sessions in the mosque in different places, which you can see on my website. Um, this was another genius. I mean, this, this man had no fear um, about most things, and, but he was a showman. I mean, he was, I, I brought Doug Henning's cats up there, big lions, so he could play with the lions. Um, he was just, we would eat breakfast with him with about 15 people, and he would just tell stories about Joe Frazier, what a bum he was, you know, and how he was gonna tear him apart and all these things, and you just, it was just special to be around documenting these moments when that next fight happened. And then I spent time with him after he got his jaw busted by Ken Norton. And I went down to New Jersey and spent time with him there, went to the mosque with him where he was praying. So were these different sides of Ali, the women. Um, and then I was with him and I actually kind of was one of the few journalists that broke the story on his Alzheimer's. And, um, and that was really sad because we went to the gym that day and he had a hard time getting the gloves on. He had a hard time eating breakfast at, at his mansion. Um, I don't think the marriage was doing great at that point. And um, you could see him nodding off and slipping, but this is right in the prime. You don't get much better than this with him. And it's one of my uh, favorite people, him and Spielberg, probably everybody I showed you today are some of my favorite favorite photographs but um if you really got into the mind of ali and where he was probably one of the best champions 
that you know our country has ever produced and i got to photograph them a bunch of times so that was pretty awesome for me so if there's any questions on this one nope. i think penny penny might want to share something okay yeah. Hello. Hi. 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 Penny, hi. <laughs> I'm, I'm Paul's brother. Those who don't know us. Yeah, I noticed, James. I noticed. How are you James, guys? Uh, James, James was remembering when you took us to Pinewood Studios when you, you were shooting on Empire Strikes Back. I was going to use those photos, Penny, tonight, but I didn't. And that was... <laughs> Do you remember that when we were there and everybody, yeah. were, I think we were there for tea time. And I think it was when we were trying to do the photo session with Carrie Fisher, Harrison Ford, Mark yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. Carrie Fisher kept throwing a hissy fit because she wanted her photographer to shoot it. And I couldn't <laughs> kind of get them all together, but it was, yeah, we, was there for, we were there for 10 weeks. Remember? Oh, were you? Well, yeah. that's when... That was, I, that's when James first fell in love. It's one of those moments when when people say to you, um, so who have you met? Who have you met? <laughs> what, but what famous people have you met? <laughs> and and when I come out with, I sat next to Chewbacca <laughs> yeah. underneath the Millennium Falcon on the set of Empire Strikes Back, they go, <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was pretty wow, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. It was. Lovely to see it. Yeah. And then um, holding Carrie Fisher's hand was, was oh, she was my first love. She was. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, she, you know, that was a good one to hold on to. That's a nice fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, of course, she was with Harrison Ford at the time, so we couldn't get, well, yes. we couldn't get around that. Well, it's so nice of you both to call in. Yeah. Thank you. It's been nice. so long. Nice and, to see you. Well, looking Thank good. You. Thank you. You are, you are both too. Okay. <laughs> Lots of love. Thank you, guys. Mark Ellery has a question for you. Hi, Ellery. Um, hi, Mark. Uh, I'm wondering in terms of the Ali photograph, did you, is that just the natural lighting or did you light any of that? Or are no. you just like running in and grabbing what action photos you can uh, with whatever natural light is around? Well, he had enough light in there um, to make sure he was lit well all the time. <laughs> so um, there was a, yeah. I, I, that was all natural light. I wasn't exactly running around because he had this sequence where he would box in the ring, take off the gloves, which he didn't shoot, and jump down to the dog. And, and um, so I was just waiting there, Ellery, for the dog. But I, I thought it might be a poodle. It could be a schnauzer. I didn't know Joe Frazier was going to be a German Shepherd. You know, I had, I had no idea. Right. And I just figured being as short as I am, he could take a big bite out of my leg. So I would kind of leave that alone. But anyway, well, thanks for asking. Yeah, it was sure. always, always it's a good a, Such a good photo. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I thank everybody for coming. Um, Lex, is there something that we're supposed to do now? I don't see any more questions, but if anybody wants to raise their hand, you can go ahead and, and I'll pull you on screen and unmute you. Um, I see Paul would like to say something. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Oh, oh, oh we have a Paul Harris. The, the stories that you tell, each one just reminds me as a photographer of challenges Ooh. I have also faced. And one particular one was being asked by authority or the police to hand over film. And I handed my film over twice, except it was blank. What I did once with Reagan and once with Tom Cruise, confronted by police, I saw what was about to happen and I hid the actual film from the camera in my sock by going down and pretending I was doing a, a shoelace or something and then actually slipping a blank film into the camera, standing up. And when they actually, with the cruise thing, they actually threatened me with arrest to be taken away if I didn't do it when I came all about my rights and this and that. And I had done the film and went off and that was that. But they never knew they had a blank film. But it's really, it really interesting, everything you've said. And it was very sad to see Ivor in bed. I don't know what's happened. I know. It was very sad to see Ivor in bed, but at least he, he called in. Yeah, I've been in that situation where I had left Prince Paul 
um, on some assignment, and and uh, it was a taking over when Prince Charles was trying to. Uh, oh, it was when the Bahamas was abdicating to, you know, to the Queen, and and I had taken some pictures of these guys that were trying to hold up uh, the abdication, and um, the FBI got them and wanted them, and it, I refused to give them to them at the end because they were a bunch of people that were there were a bunch of drunks you know, trying to take over the island. So it didn't make anything. But being in that situation, you did exactly the right thing. I don't know why it was, you know, it was always that way that if we were out there doing that, the police would try to come in and harass you and, and take the film away. And they had no rights to do that. Zero, zero. <laughs> I do. But thanks for calling. It's great to see you. Fantastic event. Yeah. Thank we'll you. Get, yeah, we'll get to get, thanks, Paul. We'll get together again. And now I'm going to pull on the other Paul, <laughs> Paul Harrison. Hey, Paul. I'm being I'm being greedy. Sorry, okay. I'm being greedy. Coming in for a second question. That's okay. Um, um, I just I just remember the um, the great. Um, I think it was a couple of weeks at least that we spent in London when you came over to uh, take photographs of William, you know, Prince William and Kate's wedding, the royal wedding. And and uh, it was when I was when I was the royal correspondent, and we 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 had a pretty good spot. We did we? overlooking, you know, overlooking the uh, sort of you know comings and goings from Westminster Abbey. But what struck me at the time, and, and probably did you as well, is that you know the photographs that everyone was taking, and, and the press pack was one of the biggest press packs I've seen. Hmm. Um, but of course, beyond the press packs were the hundreds if not thousands of people who were there as well also taking their own photographs and it just struck me i wonder i wonder what your thoughts are on um the kind of uh, photojournalism of today you know my phone has got a leica lens on it it shoots you know a beautiful shot uh, not as good as i'm sure uh, uh, many people shoot but you know everyone's got a camera on their phone, everyone's taking photographs. You've got some really rare photos. I'd imagine it, they're less rare now that everybody takes photographs of everybody they see in the street. And um, it could have been pretty tough in, you know, it's it's pretty tough, I guess, for for, for photographers on the either the journalistic beat or just the celebrity beat um, to take good shots that no one else has. I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, a two part question there because if you're photographing still the celebrities today, you know, you're either working for Getty or you're working for a company like that. And there's really, you have to sign contracts. And, and I find that, and that was starting back years ago. I find that so restrictive that, you know, that you, it, it makes really difficult for photographers to have those intimate moments that I think I was able to capture versus this, you know, the studio stuff, this mm -hmm. and that. But I find with everybody, with their cameras and everything. The difference is, is that you can think about taking a great shot and everybody's got their cameras up. But it, Paul, I swear, it's just not the same thing. I mean, I could shoot nice shots with my Leica 12 plus and all that, but it's not really thinking behind the camera. I mean, you mm -hmm. can pose and do a selfie and you can do all those different things. But I think for, as a photographer, as a professional photographer, as a photojournalist, you know, you want to, you really want to be able to compose, see what those shots are. And I don't think basically not putting down the general public, those shots are more for social. They seem to be, you know, unless you're Soderbergh and you're making a movie on an iPhone, you know, <laughs> which, you know, which is terrific how you do that. But, um, you know, the one thing I, I wanted to tell you that I didn't tell you that this is how this whole, why we're doing this today was when I was with you, because I was with Paul shooting for Sky, and um, I was having a problem with my eyes. And I was having really problems when they came out of the, um, out of the Abbey. And I was, I was, all of a sudden, my eyes started to get blurry, and I couldn't really focus. So I had autofocus on, but I had enough, you know, it was, I was okay. And that was what started kind of the deterioration of my eyes. Luckily, everything came out sharp as a tag, but I was it, it, I was looking through it and I panicked because there was like sweat down here on my back when they started walking out. And I couldn't, I didn't say anything to you because you, you, you were busy with trying to get everybody on camera. 
you know, at that point. I think you were. We were trying to, and in fact, we were running over somehow to the to uh, Buckingham Palace, which was hard. So I got that was my defining moment when I knew something was wrong, and I knew yeah. something, and it deteriorated that time. So I always, every time I shot, I took an assistant with me to make sure that through the ground glass that, that I was in focus. You know, which is good. <laughs> but that's a great question. iPhones, iPhone twelves. I think they're terrific for the amateurs, and um, and they're and they're terrific for the professionals as well. But you know, but for fun, I mean, for things that you know miss, and the quality is good enough where you can kind of download it or use it, you know, if you have to, you know, that sort of thing. So, but thank you for that. Those were yeah, pleasure. It's great to see you, Paul. You too. You too. Great to see you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Paul. Uh, we've got a couple more questions, Mark. Okay. Um, I'm going to pull on Lori. Go ahead, Lori. Mark, can you hear me? There we are. Hi, Mark. Hi, Lori. How are you? So excited to be here. Nice to nice, see you. Nice to see you too. I'm, I'm thrilled for your uh, coffee table book. Great. And uh, besides, of course, being a fantastic photographer, you're a wonderful storyteller. Well, so, you. will you be including copy or stories uh, of the photos? Oh, you know, yeah. with that and. And I hope you're doing that for the book. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. In fact, we've written out most of the stuff that you saw today um, into mm -hmm. a longer form and trying to get, get that. It's time to do a coffee table book. Um, and I just haven't had time to do it because I've been working with you and right. um, <laughs> trying to do it. <laughs> but, but it's terrific. I just I love hearing the stories behind the photos. And I just think that's a, a spectacular idea. So, yay. Well, thank you. And thanks for calling in, and we'll of talk. This, and we'll talk this yeah, way. Well, yeah. Are you in Paris? And uh, Mark Ellery is going to come on and ask a question for someone whose mic is not working. Okay. Yeah, Laura. Hi, uh, Laura Fremont. It's um, mic isn't working, but wants to know if you could give a a. a brief recap of the story behind the photo of John and Yoko that's sure. on one of your boards. Yeah, I, first of all, I, you know, it was difficult to, for every for us to arrange all of these photographs into one session. So we picked five. The John Lennon one that you see behind me is, is again, one of my favorites. When I was with the guy you saw in the hospital bed, and um, we were, we were out, I was left New York and I'd come out to California because I'd photographed John in New York when he got busted for pot. And, um, and he came out here to Harry Nielsen's house in 1975. And he and Harry were just tearing it up. I mean, at the Troubadour, they were doing as much drugs as they could. And John had left, had left uh, Yoko and was hanging out or dating May Pang was her name, which was his girlfriend at the time. And, um, and what happened was it got so crazy out here. I called the lost weekend. Um, I found out from John that Yoko was coming back out to LA to take him home. And I asked John if I could go on the plane with them and ride back to New York. And what's so, you know, so when you think about it, it's like, well, they're just going to be on a plane together, right? And they're going to be sitting in. But when you look at this picture and when I put it up on the next, because we're going to do this again, and this will be continuing. Um, continuing shows, she's got her arm around her man and she's not letting her man go. And he's got his arm around her. I think he's still a little stoned at this point, but he's um, there together. And it's hard to see the shot in the background, but um, it's probably the most loving picture besides the pictures of any Leibowitz with the two of them in bed. To me, this photograph is very organic. And, and just shows the love that they have between the two of them. And, and it seems to resonate um, with people that see it because they can really see what the two of them really feel together, how glued they are as a couple. At this, at this point, you know, she was just trying to get John back to New York. So this was 1975 and five years later he was gone. So yeah, that's the story to that photograph. Mark, we've got another question for you from Greg. Hey, Greg. Let's see if I can do this Zoom thing. I'm not 
really proficient at it. Um, it struck me when you were talking about uh, Robin Williams that the time we did that shoot at you know for People Magazine, which one? That, uh, the one with the duck. <laughs> the duck. Uh, well, the one with the duck. It was a cover, and uh, you, as a friend of uh, Robin's, you know, he was kind of spilling his guts to you, and then the reporter decided to rewrite the story. And then not shortly after that, we ended up having to do uh, Comic Relief 3. And mm. uh, Robin wasn't very cooperative because he thought you had something to do with that. I'd kind of like to hear your take on that one. Well, the take on that was one of the worst things. In fact, it's been published in a number of books. Um, the problem with that was that it was a life, if you remember, Greg, it was a Life magazine reporter that was very famous. And this was Good Morning Vietnam. And Robin had been nominated for an Academy Award. And, you know, with Robin, as I said earlier, you could always bring props. And he was always, whatever you needed, he would do. And so I brought a live duck, a springboard. Um, we brought some other stuff, I think. And we had his whole entourage there, you know, for the, for the show. I think the manager was there for a while. The publicists were there for a while. And I got all of my photos first. And the reporter took Robin out. And he got him to talk about the nanny, having the affair with the nanny, the cocaine, um, breaking up with his first wife, problems in the business. This was supposed to be a, a, a photograph that really showing his success, his Academy Award nomination. And um, it became such a calamity. It became all out, all out war between creative artists, all the other agencies in town. Um, and People Magazine was banned for three years to photograph any clients at CAA. And I was kind of blamed for it because it was in my studio. And um, it wasn't a cool thing at all. It wasn't cool. That's when the magazine, because you were with me, that's when the magazine was really starting to take a dive towards really, you know, buzz journalism, where it was just National Enquirer stuff that kind of still the magazine's a great hit, but this was really, I mean, this was a crazy scene that I forgot you were there, Greg, but we had, we had to kind of get Robin out of there. We had to get the publicist with the, the publicist was eating a tuna fish sandwich, getting fat, if I remember, you know, and we had, to, it was terrible. And I had to fly the film to New York and they told me they were going to run this terrible cover. I got into a big fight with them, said, you can't do this. You're going to ruin the relationship. And anyway, show business. I, I just remember that uh, Robin had a Perrier bottle that he uh, had with him at the end of the Comic Relief 3 and was placing it strategically uh, throughout most of that shoot. So even on the back cover of the video, uh, it's very strategically placed. Um, he wasn't very cooperative after that. The other one that, uh, that I liked, uh, well, first of all, I like your desperation poster in the background. I wish they had. Thank you. You worked on that movie, so I'm, I'm still I'm still here in Tucson. I wish you'd get me out of here, but that's another story. Okay. Um, the uh, one where we went for the last night of Cheers, and mm -hmm. uh, they had their staff photographer come on, and yeah. you wanted to get the shots she was getting, and you ended up getting one. And we got that on the cover as well. Do you remember that one? I remember that because we had done our official picture and then they had their photographer and she was getting a little wild. But if you remember, Greg, I was underneath her and I was getting them to take their clothes off. And so we got, in, I got in a lot of trouble with the director afterwards because they ran the picture the photograph in us with Ted Danton and his pants down and George Will, which wasn't a good looking picture and you know, everybody in the cast, but it was fun. You know, yeah. you gotta, get, gotta to take it when you can get it. <laughs> well, the other one was uh, when we got kicked out of uh, 13th Annual People's Choice Awards, we had our spot all set up and lit and they moved in Kenny Rogers with uh, one shot to do of Jimmy Stewart. Right. Um, the other one that struck me that night was that we didn't really have a prop for Pat Sajak. So you told me to hand him a guitar. That's and, right. uh, the, the look on his face was pretty funny. <laughs> because, uh, anyway. That's a lot funny. of good memories, Mark. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. Well, you were great grateful. To, you were grateful great to, to be here. invited. You know, thank you. Thank, thanks, Greg. Thanks for calling in. Hope to see you. Okay. Yeah, I hope to too. Thanks, Greg. So, Mark, I think that it looks like that that might be it. Um, do you want to just tell folks where they can go if they would like to? Yeah. Reference? I would. You know, I'd love to go. To, you go to the Senate 
photography.com and um and you can certainly go in there because this is all for um the stein eye institute and there's limited editions there's even a new category we call bespoke which is you can make your own one of a kind with a collage of photographs and i've done the, like six examples you know if you wanted more than one celebrity in the photograph and you can and those are all signed by me and they're uh, 20 by 24 so it's almost like a beautiful poster and then there's the regular stuff in the store what i also want to do is i want to thank you know obviously um uh, dr najad for everything she did for me and i want to i want to thank my friend um craig hessling craig heisling i'm sorry i always say his name wrong um who is a great creative help with me on this, putting all this together, did a sensational job. And Ellery and Lex, thank you so much for helping me put all this together. And Dr. Mishad, you're back. We thank you for my eyesight and everything and hosting this with us today. It was just great. Thank you. This was so amazing. And you are just a, a genius behind the lens. So <laughs> thank I'm, glad you. To, I'm glad to have uh, restored your ability to continue taking photos because we all can use more, obviously. Yeah, we can. And I'm going to do more of it, so which is great. So thank you, everybody. We're going to close out with Kodachrome <laughs> <laughs> one more time. And now we're great. Does everybody remember that song? The app. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for joining, everybody. When I think back on all the crap I learned in high school, it's a wonder. Everything looks worse in black and white. Go to Chrome.